One of the scariest things about multiple sclerosis is that patients can get worse and when and how that happens are usually unpredictable and random. This can cause anxiety and lots of issues and Dr. Patricia Coyle will talk about what to do when a symptom worsens or the disease seems to be progressing. My name is Patricia K. Coyle. I'm Professor of Neurology, Vice Chair for Clinical Affairs in the Department of Neurology at Stony Brook University Medical Center in New York, and I direct the MS Comprehensive Care Center at Stony Brook. One of the most feared statements for a neurologist to hear is when they have a person with MS walk into their office and say, I'm getting worse because it raises so many nasty possibilities. The first important thing is to really precisely define why the MS individual is saying that they're worse. For example, have they had an increase in symptoms such as depression or pain or spasticity? Or are they having a side effect, an adverse event from a medication that was recently started? If that's the explanation, then obviously we're going to pursue taking care of that. Um, could it be stress or psychosocial issues? What's going on in the marriage, in the workplace, in school? Are there financial issues? Those sorts of external pressures can clearly make an MS individual perceive that they're getting worse. What about comorbid conditions or intercurrent infection? In the last couple of years, we've recognized exactly how important comorbid conditions are in MS and that they're increased, they're more frequent. If an MS patient has uncontrolled hypertension, they're not going to feel well. Could that MS patient have thyroid disease? That's a comorbid immune-mediated disorder that's increased in MS. Could they have an unrecognized infection, a prolonged bronchitis? that MS individual is going to perceive that they're worse. Could it be the old good day, bad day phenomenon? We know that particularly MS patients that have a number of lesions can fluctuate from day to day. I think you'd really want to know that somebody was worse on a more prolonged basis. And then, of course, we have to take into account aging. We all age. As we get older, our memory is not as good. We're not going to be quite cognitively as quick. We're not going to be motor-wise quite as fast as coordinated. But then we're left with the dreaded breakthrough disease activity. That's the most ominous for a neurologist because that means the individual's MS is not well controlled, and we're going to have to do something about that. Now, this is most pertinent particularly to the MS individual where we've started a disease-modifying therapy. We have 15 such DMTs at the current time. When we start a DMT, we're going to be very interested in following that individual quite closely to make sure there's not unacceptable breakthrough disease activity that would indicate that they're a suboptimal responder or even a treatment failure. Now, none of these 15 DMTs are said to be cures. None of them can we, truly have an ex can we truly have an expectation that there won't be a single new evidence of breakthrough disease activity. But quite frankly, we've all seen patients do phenomenally well. No relapses over years, no worsening on the neurological exam, the MRI scan remaining completely stable, almost meeting what we call no evidence of disease activity or NIDA. And that's really what we would like when we start a disease-modifying therapy in an MS patient. We really want to so-called treat to target. We want to have a goal, and we want to follow that goal and try to establish that goal. We would love to have no overt disease activity or, at the very worst, minimal disease activity. But one issue is experts in MS have not yet uh, really defined what minimal disease activity would be. So we're constantly looking for breakthrough disease activity, particularly in the first two years when we start a new disease-modifying therapy. And that breakthrough activity covers clinical features and MRI features, so relapses, clinical attacks, very important that every MS individual 
understands what an MS attack is. And if they don't, ask questions. You need to really understand that. Because if you think you're having an attack, you need to report that. That's something that we really want to evaluate and count. And I personally will bring patients in, I'll bring the MS individual in to document whether there's any worsening on the neurological exam. And if I'm suspicious of a clinical attack, a relapse, I'm going to probably do an MRI scan. Another clinical sign of disease activity is the neurological exam worsening. Or could a relapsing patient even be transitioning, moving into a progressive stage of their MS, where there's gradual clinical worsening? This might be picked up on deterioration in walking ability, a very slow over months deterioration in walking ability. So too, you can go slowly worse on cognition. That's a completely different clinical sphere, but that can occur as well. And then breakthrough activity on the MRI scan. It has been recommended and is clinical practice to do a monitoring surveillance brain MRI with and without contrast six months after starting a new disease modifying therapy and then every one to two years. Why? Because in relapsing MS, particularly in the early years, there's way more lesion formation in the CNS than any clinical attack. These lesions are five to 10 times more common than a relapse. They're occurring in so-called silent areas of the central nervous system of the brain, but they're not really silent. They're hitting CNS reserve, and that's harmful to the patient. We don't want a lot of spontaneous uh, breakthrough MRI activity. Now, what about the relapses? I said that every patient needs to understand and know what a relapse is. That's new or recurrent neurological problems that last more than 24 hours that are not occurring in the setting of an acute infection or fever or a significant inflammatory issue that might suggest it's a pseudo relapse. You can have a temporary metabolic deterioration if the body temperature is raised or if you're fighting off an infection simply on a temporary failure of nerve conductions in old scarred areas. So I like to bring the patient in, as I said. I think recognizing breakthrough relapses is very important. And we're not only counting them, we want to know how severe they are. An attack, a clinical attack or relapse that involves motor weakness, or in coordination or bladder or bowel issues, that's a more severe relapse than a relapse that just had sensory function or vision function. And we want to know, does the patient, does the individual recover from the relapse? That's very important. Incomplete recovery from a clinical attack indicates that relapse was much more severe than a relapse in which there's complete recovery. And I want to know how much silent MRI activity has there been with that clinical attack. And that's why I will always do MR imaging in that setting. Well, what about worsening on the neurological exam and the dreaded fear of moving from relapsing to progressive MS? Well, the current studies, for the most part, have shown in the treatment era the percent of relapsing patients moving to secondary progressive disease is markedly down, significantly down, compared to natural history untreated databases. And that's good news. That's saying that our current DMTs seem to be able to ward off transition from relapsing to secondary progressive MS. We hope, ultimately, can prevent it completely. And again, very good things to follow. Over 80% of patients that transition to progressive disease are going to show walking, gait and walking difficulties. So that's particularly, uh, that's particularly important to follow. A very good, easy test for the physician to do is a 25-foot time walk. We do that in every MS patient on every visit. And a very easy test to monitor cognition is called the, si the simple digit modality test. That can be done in a few minutes. It can be done on every office visit. So you should make sure to mention this to your neurologist. 25 foot time walk covers the gait and the walking and the simple digit modality test 
uh, will, will follow cognitive issues. The MRI scan in the individual transitioning to progressive MS, I expect to see increased atrophy in the brain. That's a measure that we don't routinely examine, but it's going to be the first non-conventional imaging technique to move into clinical use on a single patient basis. There are two commercial programs that measure brain volume loss, so-called brain atrophy, and we're beginning to see studies where that's being provided on an individual patient basis, and that may very well instruct how we evaluate patients who say, I'm worse in the future. So what to do in the patient who comes in with MS and says, I'm getting worse? First of all, in the last couple of years, we've recognized how important it is to boost CNS reserve. We can help our brain. We can help our brain withstand insults. We can help our brain recover. But it's through a wellness health maintenance program and control of vascular risk factors like hypertension, increased lipids, diabetes or prediabetes that harm the central nervous system. So every MS patient needs to be instructed to follow a wellness program, not smoke, ideal body weight, regular exercise, healthy anti-inflammatory diet, good sleep, control of comorbid medical conditions that can damage their central nervous system. In starting a disease-modifying therapy, that surveillance monitoring brain MRI with and without contrast is a protection because it may be that MRI disease breakthrough, disease activity, is expected to occur even before there's clinical features. And so that's very important. But it need, the MRI scan needs to be done at the same facility, ideally. And it needs to be able to be compared to the prior MRI scans. And that means it needs to have the identical sequences done. So you can't willy-nilly go from center to center to do the MRI scan. It's very important in monitoring surveillance that it be legitimately able to be compared to the prior studies to comment if there are new or enlarging lesions or contrast-enhancing lesions. And in an MS patient on a disease-modifying therapy, on a disease-modifying therapy with unacceptable breakthrough activity, we have multiple choices. We want to switch. And if I'm switching a DMT based on breakthrough disease activity, then efficacy of the new agent that I choose becomes very, very important. So I want to end on a very hopeful note. We have 15 DMTs, all for relapsing forms of MS. We've just gotten our first DMT for progressive from onset MS, for primary progressive MS. That's earth shaking. It's one of many to follow because we've been focusing on progressive MS, on the neurodegenerative phase. We've known that there haven't been treatments. We're going to see more. But particularly for that MS patient who says, I'm getting worse and has fixed deficits, do we have meaningful CNS repair strategies? Well, none are approved yet, but we've actually moved to multiple trials in individuals with MS testing various CNS repair strategies. It's only a matter of time before we have them established. So we'll be able to say to that MS individual who comes in saying, I'm worse, I'm getting worse, and it's breakthrough disease activity, we will have better treatments to control that, and I believe in the not too distant future, even treatments to repair fixed deficit. Thank you.